story four of the human boy again by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story four the tiger's tale one curiously enough a very curious thing happened to the other foreign curiosity that johnson maximus sent to dr dunstan you may remember that johnson who is in the merchant service brought the doctor home a parrot and a tiger's skin and that strange things overtook the parrot especially after death well strange things also overtook the bengal tiger skin owing to me and freckles and smith i am macmullen and the real name of freckles was maine and he came from australia and had a great ambition to be a bush ranger in course of time and revive the practice of bush ranging in new south wales among other things that he had was an important bowie knife the same the chinese boy tin ling chow borrowed to commit harry carey with and failed well with his great feeling for sport freckles naturally felt a good deal of interest in the tiger skin and often went to look at it in the doctor's study it was a good one no doubt white and yellow and black with a long tail and a very fine head in this head were glass eyes like life and the mouth was open and pink with terrific teeth worn smooth where the tiger had chewed his prey then there came to merivale a kid called smith he was very small but pretty solid and rather decent and keen as mustard and fiery in colour too it's a rum thing with boys that some get chums with the greatest ease and some never do and also the boys who often want to make chums never do for some reason or other but this kid soon made chums though i couldn't tell you why of course he was nothing to me because i'm thirteen in fact nearly fourteen but for a chap just ten he was all right and other chaps of his own age found him interesting he had a lot of rather peculiar knowledge gathered up from his father who was a very learned man and wrote books for libraries and he believed in heathen charms and old sayings and remembered many queer things that his father had told him he wanted to be the caretaker of a museum some day but he said that he hoped to be allowed to travel round the world first like darwin did and see dwarfs and giants and write books and shoot a few specimens of different things not often heard of of course he went through the ordinary adventures of new boys at merivale and it was in the matter of the kid test that he became so generally known as a kid out of the common there is just beyond the cricket ground and before you come to the wood a huge clump of rhododendrons that is covered with purple flowers in may it is just the sort of place that a wild beast would choose for its lair if there were wild beasts at merivale and it was a regular thing with kids to tell them that a savage animal did live there and only came out at night this beast was a test of the pluck of new kids and the new kid who would walk past the rhododendrons after dark alone was considered to be all right of course something was done to make it seem more terrible and in fact till he left john batson the gardener's boy was always told to hide in the rhododendrons and shake the bushes and growl when a test was being made this he did very well having a chronicle sore throat and a very harsh and growling voice like a ferocious beast but he had to go owing to some row with the servants and the new gardener's boy could only squeak and was useless for the test generally however somebody in the fifth could be got and for some time freckles kindly obliged when a test had to be made it amused him and he growled very fairly well and could also imitate wolves in a state of hunger which he had once heard at a menagerie well young smith was told about the mystery of the rhododendron bed and seemed more interested than frightened hasn't anybody ever seen the thing he asked no answered steggles who was there the sound it makes is so frightful that chaps generally run for their lives and never wait to see it smith was very keen about it i wish my father would come up and hear it he said the point is exclaimed freckles that each kid must go past alone it only growls for kids and doesn't growl for grown-up people it is a test of bravery there are chaps here still who have never been brave enough to pass after the first growl they were chaps who turned out quite brave in every other way too what have i to do asked smith 
you've got to walk out on an appointed night after evening school and go round the rhododendron bed twice no matter what happens it is a winter beast and is never heard in the summer so it is a winter test you've just come in time for it exclaimed fowle who was also there smith had been at merivale about a fortnight when he was asked to undergo the great kid test he thought a bit after this speech from fowle then he asked a question and what do you think the creature is well, nobody knows said fowle of course if that was really known something might be done it ought to be shot said smith but gideon thought not they all pretended to be serious and smith quite believed the story because he was very young in fact only one kid had ever refused to believe it no declared gideon it may be the only beast of its kind in the world and to shoot it would be a thousand pities then it ought to be photographed said smith impossible because nobody ever sees it answered steggles that's no reason said smith it might be done with runken rays which shows what a clever kid he was though so ready to believe this rot about the beast one person did see it however said fowle and that was montgomery who went into a bank last term and it left a great impression upon him what did he say it looked like asked smith a sort of thing between a tiger and a donkey answered fowle very seriously rum said smith it might belong to the zebra family zebras don't growl said freckles more they do admitted smith they bray then he went on to tell us some things about zebras that we didn't know ourselves if it could be killed it would be a good thing said smith and the chap who did it would have a very precious charm because the skin or part of the skin of a savage beast is a very tremendous charm to the man or boy who gets it the boringos my father said at least i think they were boringos or if not kinnatus or some other tribe always wear the skin of a fierce beast next their own skin and by so doing get the fierceness of the beast into themselves and so nobody ever interferes with them and they always have the most remarkable luck and live to a great age so this fierce beast would be a good chance you might have a dash at it said freckles though he could hardly help laughing if you killed it and skinned it and wore a bit of the skin it would be a fine thing for you yes it would admitted smith i'd risk a good deal but i've got nothing to kill anything with except a catapult and of course that's no good against a fierce and growling beast everybody laughed but young smith was as serious as possible if anybody would lend me a decent knife i'll have a go he said you'll be frightened when you hear its dreadful sound declared fowle i was and i'm never ashamed to say so very likely i might be admitted smith but often a jolly good thing has been done by a man who was in funk at the time and i'd have a dash anyhow because i think if i succeeded and got a charm that would last for a lifetime i'll lend you my well-known bowie knife if you'll be careful of it said freckles with that he took it out of his pocket where it hangs suspended by a lanyard so that freckles can get it in a moment in time of need when he goes on his hunting expeditions on half holidays young smith thanked him frightfully and took the knife it's just been sharpened for me by the gardener explained freckles it can pretty well cut hair so you'd better be careful and smith promised he would be then it was decided that the test should take place that evening before evening prep it was a good day to choose because the doctor and mrs dunstan were going out to dinner somewhere and we always felt a sort of feeling of more freedom at such times when the kid had gone i warned freckles that he might be doing a dangerous thing but he laughed and said not then steggles had one of his terrific ideas that nobody gets but steggles and he said what a lark it would be if we could fake up a fierce beast and make it come out of the rodo bed just as you let off a frightful yell freckles of course freckles admitted it would with some kids one couldn't dare he said such a thing happening to mathers for instance would certainly make him go dotty forever but this kid doesn't know what fear is it would be a lark to see what he'd do you'd better be pretty careful or he'll stab you said gideon he's jolly quick and you'd look rather a fool if a new kid went and ran you through with your own bowie knife 
so i should admitted freckles but i'm not afraid you forget my great power of seeing in the dark i'm jolly near as good as a cat at it then i suddenly had the most awfully fine idea apart from machinery that ever i did have little did i know what would happen but still looking back it is only fair to me to admit the awful fineness of the idea i said the doctor being out couldn't we get the tiger rug and stuff it with pillows and stick it up on four cricket stumps just round the corner of the roto bed then where we are all hidden behind the pavilion we see the fun and after it's over and the kid has bolted we can take the skin back freckles whistled and steggles asked did you think of this all by yourself macmullen and i said certainly i did but gideon thought it wouldn't do in his excitement he might actually stab the skin he said and that would lessen the value of it a great deal the doctor would be frightfully annoyed not that that matters said steggles no admitted gideon not to us but a treasure is a treasure and just for the sake of swizzling a kid it seems a pity to spoil a valuable tiger skin worth three or four pounds at least and perhaps more however we didn't look at it in that light steggles and freckles were a great deal taken with the idea and fowl who was something of an artist or thought he was promised to make the tiger skin look alive if somebody else got it of course he wouldn't have run the risk of taking it such an utter footling coward as him no more would steggles i and freckles both wanted to have the honour of getting it and i argued that as the idea was mine i ought to be allowed to do this but freckles said that as a much more experienced hand at adventures and dangers than me he must do it he said if it was machinery mac i should say nothing but for breaking rules and doing daring things after dark you are not in it with me which was true so he got the rug and was late for prayers in consequence but when briggs reads prayers instead of the doctor many are late because briggs is short-sighted besides the other masters generally don't come at all when briggs reads them though they never dare to stop away when the doctor does anyhow freckles got the rug and fowl with some cricket pads and thompson's bicycle faked up a most extraordinary and hideous monster looking out of the rhododendrons it glared through its glass eyes and seemed ready to spring and its tail was stretched into the path with the point as it were wagging like a cat wags her tail when she's in a bait even before dusk it looked terrible but much more so when it began to get dark then the time came and we hid behind the edge of the pavilion and freckles practised a growl or two and got into the rodo bed and steggles found young smith and told him the time for the test had come steggles said the playground is quite empty now and i see the rhododendrons bending in the middle so the beast is evidently there you'd better be quick and go and get it over twice round mind smith was pale but firm one thing he said the chap called fowl has been trying to funk me all the afternoon and he says the beast has killed two boys in its time and that they were both red-haired boys of course if that's true it is rather serious me being red-haired you needn't mind what fowl says answered steggles he never passed the test at all i remember when he came as a kid the nastiest kid that ever did come for that matter he is a coward to the backbone and would rather have paid away his pocket money for the whole of the term than go through the test so i was told said smith and i told him he was a coward and i didn't care for him trying to funk me all the time if it really and truly killed two boys with red hair it didn't replied steggles on my word of honour it didn't it feeds on poultry i believe and nobody can really prove that it ever killed a boy you must show what you're made of and you'll soon find you've got good friends up in the fifth form including me myself as for fowl since travers licked him with one hand tied behind him and since johnson found the name of maud written thirty-two times in various letterings on his blotting paper nobody has cared to be seen with him he can draw angels with wings fairly well though nobody wants them when they are drawn and that's all he can do but sneak and tell lies and be a cur in general 
so smith was comforted and took out the bowie knife lent him by freckles and went off as he supposed into the empty playground but there were at least twenty chaps hidden there to see what he would make of the beast that fowl and freckles and i had set up two well young smith came boldly on and only stopped when freckles gave his first growl then the kid stood still and then he pulled out the bowie knife and opened it he evidently felt that it would be better to do the deed pretty quick before he had time to think about it so despite the sounds and howls of freckles he dashed round at his best pace and was actually past the beast before he had grasped the horror of it but he knew it all right and he told me afterwards that the moment he saw it he began to stream with perspiration strangely enough though the night was jolly cold he also said that there came a very strange feeling in the pit of his stomach but he couldn't be sure whether he felt frightfully hungry or merely that he was going to be sick he waited a moment before making the second dash round and we could see him dimly panting and his breath going into the air like steam at the same moment the bell also rang but nobody went immediately because we wanted to see if smith would face the beast again freckles now began to imitate wolves in a state of hunger and steggles bet me sixpence that smith wouldn't go round again but of course nobody but new boys who don't know him ever bets with steggles as he has never been known to pay when he loses so i took no notice then smith dashed round again and we were just going to come out and rot him about it and cheer him for passing the test when he did a thing of the most astonishing character he seemed now to have got a little accustomed to the horror of the beast and he suddenly crept towards it with the bowie knife of freckles ready to strike he regularly stalked it like a hunter stalks his prey and freckles who was hidden just behind the beast growled and roared all he could but i think he roared rather nervously for the kid looked frightfully keen and evidently meant to have a dash at the beast whatever happened we were just going to rush out and stop him but he didn't give us time he suddenly screamed very loudly partly to keep up his own courage and partly to distract the beast and then he dashed forward and stooped down and cut the creature's tail off at a blow he then leapt aside very cunningly to avoid its spring as he told me afterwards but of course it didn't spring but only glared a moment later smith was flying for his life with the tail as if this wasn't curious enough still stranger things happened afterwards because the next difficulty was what to do about it in fact after young smith had hooked it with the tail of the doctor's tiger skin the rest of us looked rather fools of course the first thing to do was to get the skin back into the study and this freckles did and the next thing to do was to get the tail back from smith and this fowl who was monitor in smith's dormitory promised to do that night but smith wouldn't give it up he had most carefully hidden it and absolutely refused to give it to anybody the next day freckles and steggles and i had smith before us in the gym and asked for an explanation we told him all about the test and applauded him for his bravery but explained that the tail he had cut off belonged to dr dunstan's tiger skin and that its loss would make an awful row in the school and very likely end in his being expelled then he said that dr dunstan couldn't expel him because he wouldn't know he had had anything to do with the tail which was true besides the doctor being so blind it might be a long time before he discovered the tail was gone then smith argued jolly well for a kid he said that for all he knew the beast that we had made was a live and furious and dangerous beast therefore his bravery in cutting the tail off single-handed with a bowie knife was just as great as if it had been alive freckles admitted this he said that the bravery of smith was undoubtedly immense and that so far as that went he richly deserved to keep the tail he even said that if he could have spared it he would have given smith the famous bowie knife but of course he could not do this for it was his most important arm in all his own adventures when he practised to become a bushranger 
then steggles asked smith what he had done with the tail and smith made us promise faithfully not to tell and we did so then he said he was wearing it next his skin round his stomach in fact and always should do so for the rest of his life if it worked well he said it's awfully uncomfortable and scratches something frightful but that's a mere nothing to the advantages i didn't of course kill the tiger but in a way i might have and anyhow i thought it was alive and i'm going to give it a fair trial i asked him what he expected the tiger's tail would do for him and he said make me fierce by rights the fierceness of the tiger ought to go straight into me and i ought to fear nothing in the same way that the tiger when it was alive feared nothing but as i didn't actually kill the tiger of course it may not work as i hope he assured us solemnly that he believed the beast was alive when he dashed at it and cut its tail off and he also assured us that he had never seen the doctor's tiger skin and did not so much as know that he had a tiger skin and we believed him and let him keep the tail steggles however warned young smith of one thing he said be jolly careful that fowl doesn't see it when you're getting up or going to bed or very likely he'll sneak he hates you already for scoring off him so mind you hide it from him smith naturally thanked steggles a good deal for this kind advice and said that he would be cautious and that he already hated fowl a good deal and that if he really did become fierce pretty soon fowl would be the first to know it so there the thing was left and when the doctor found that his tiger tail was gone which he did do owing to one of his daughters pointing it out nobody knew anything at all about it the doctor made far more fuss than we expected and was bitterly hurt over the loss and seemed to be inclined to expel everybody because nobody would confess but of course from the business point of view he couldn't do that because as gideon said his occupation would have been over and it might have taken many years for him to collect together one hundred and three boys again gideon also said that the competition was fearful among schoolmasters and expelling was quite a thing of the past owing to the difficulty of getting new ones then came the tremendous end of the whole business and such fierceness as young smith had managed to get after wearing the tiger's tail for three days was as nothing to the fierceness of the doctor when he found it out it burst upon us on a half-holiday and the half-holiday as such was ruined by it after saying grace at dinner dr dunstan told the school to be in chapel every boy at half-past two leave was stopped and only the football team which played a match that afternoon was allowed to go everybody had theories during dinner but nobody was right or anything like right we noticed that the doctor seemed thundery and that he looked sometimes very fixedly at the bottom of the table where mr mannering the underest master of the lot though a blue presided over the dinner of the lower school then we went into chapel and those interested in the tiger's tail were all there except freckles who is in the footer eleven boys said the doctor i have received an anonymous letter and if any among you should be in doubt of the meaning of that word i may tell you that it is derived from the greek ah and onoma signifying without a name or nameless the letter is in fact unsigned now in the ordinary course of events i should disdain to notice such a communication as i remarked during a newspaper controversy in eighty two to an agnostic writer who propounded infamous opinions and hid himself behind the nom de plume of lucretius the man who fears to proclaim himself and lacks the courage of his own views ipso facto places himself beneath the notice of any serious antagonist the discussion which verged on the acrimonious and to which two bishops contributed was protracted through august and the early part of september then having proved my points to the satisfaction of all religious men i withdrew from the debate that however is not what you are here to know and indeed happened many years before any among you was born what will more directly interest you is this that for once i have decided to give weight to my nameless correspondence communication it is brief and printed in capital letters i shall rehearse it to you 
then he read out these remarkable words dear sir the tiger's tail is worn by smith next his skin under his vest that is all continued dr dunstan there is no clue either to the sender or to his object in conveying this astounding information to me concerning him i shall make researches anon when we have proved the truth or falsity of his statement but for the present we are concerned with the name of smith now the name of smith may not be familiar to many among you i find that smith is a newcomer he has been at merivale only since the beginning of this term he is very young and unusually ignorant but he is not too young and not too ignorant to know the meaning of such simple and straightforward anglo-saxon as i am in the habit of employing when i address my boys he is aware that i have a tiger skin and that this interesting relic is dear to me as the gift of one who distinguished himself within these walls and carried the moral lessons and even a little of the scholastic erudition of merivale school into the larger life beyond when he went down to the sea in ships huxley smith is also aware that this integument has been mutilated by some senseless and wicked hand then let him come forward and tell us more if indeed he knows more than we all know let him step before me and explain the significance of these words from a nameless source i hope with all my heart that he may proclaim them false and what is more approve them false for huxley smith's father is a very distinguished and learned gentleman and a fellow of the royal society it is impossible too highly to esteem his discoveries and surmises respecting the customs of the ancients such a man puts truth before all things such a man will be cut to the heart if his offspring should prove other than honest and upright come hither huxley smith so smith went and jolly cheap he looked his face turned the colour of gooseberry fool and his hair seemed to become many shades redder than usual as he walked up the chapel he was naturally small and he seemed much smaller than he was owing to walking up the chapel all alone speak said the doctor and address your remarks to me do you or do you not know what has become of the caudal appendage of my tiger skin yes i do sir replied smith you do sir then why when i invited information on this subject did you deny it to me smith did not reply to this question he merely said i cut off the tiger's tail sir in a moment of great excitement and having once got it i thought i'd keep it well may you have been excited sir at the instant of such an outrage and what next sir asked the doctor the whole of the upper part of his body began to lift in a lump as it always did when he got worked into a rage next sir i decided to wear it round my waist and will you be so good as to enlighten us as to the reason for this extraordinary decision the baringos do it sir or else the kinnatoos my father told me that they baringo sir kinnatoos sir what are the baringos to you wretched youth or the kinnatoos either because certain heathen nations as yet far from the light indulge in gross superstition for their own benighted ends and credit inanimate objects with imaginary virtues and grotesque qualities which we who are civilized know right well that they do not possess because these things are so is that any reason why a christian boy in a christian school should seek to emulate their misguided credulity the question before us is not why the baringos do these things but why you cut off my tiger's tail sir and wore it around your person to get fierce sir said smith the doctor simply heaved in his indignation to get fierce sir he said repeating smith's words in a tone of helpless despair yes please sir with luck the fierceness of the tiger ought to go into me explained smith this is almost too much said dr dunstan because i thought that to be as fierce as a bengal tiger would be useful sir smith ventured to say silence sir roared the doctor in such a tremendous tone of voice that steggles whispered to me the doctor himself must have been wearing about a dozen tigers tail all his life 
and how dare you want to be fierce sir went on the doctor you come among us a child from a christian home an inexperienced and ignorant youth and yet at ten for that is your age huxley smith you develop a disgraceful yearning to deteriorate from the state of civilization to which you were born you debase your intellect and your morality by deliberate efforts to become demoralized you seek to take a retrograde step and recover the ferocity of primitive or as we say preadamite humanity you have striven to acquire the physical brutality of paleolithic man sir and worse far worse you deliberately endeavour to impress upon your nature the disgusting attributes of one of the most pestilential animals that an inscrutable providence has created and let loose upon this planet he who could seek to secure the attributes of the tiger huxley smith must already possess the potentialities of the wild ass never in the whole course of my scholastic experience have i met anything quite so painful as this depravity in a child of ten shed no tears sir went on the doctor the time has not yet come for tears because smith was blubbing a good deal at this dreadful view the doctor had taken of him of course he didn't understand a word of it and that made it all the worse and where is my tiger's tail now sir finally asked dr dunstan on sir answered smith humbly then it had better be taken off sir said dunstan and he roared again divest yourself of your upper attire wretched boy let this lesson not be lost on the least among you take off your clothes sir so that one and all of us shall be warned what evil instincts may and do still mar human nature in the most unexpected quarters i mourn for your accomplished father smith and still more for your poor mother it was none too soon that they sent you into my care young though you be go and stand beside the fire sir that the ordeal may not physically injure you the kid went to the chapel fire which always burns in winter and took off his coat and his waistcoat his collar and his tie and his shirt and his vest under the vest fastened round pretty tight just below his ribs was the tiger's tail he looked awfully rum like this and still cried a bit a few chaps including several of the six laughed out loud at the appearance of smith and the tail but the doctor soon shut them up silence silence he shouted out this is no laughing matter main and you trelawney and you cornwallis major we ought to weep rather than laugh here is sort of lege necromancy black art in our midst here we find a boy permeated with the with the fetishism the thaumaturgy the demonology of the savage and the cannibal and what is more astounding still we find him at merivale take off that tail sir smith undid the tail and took it off there was a bright red mark all around his white body and i should think the tail must have given him a pretty good doing a tiger's hair is undoubtedly scratchy which applied to a tender part of the human frame like the stomach and perhaps savages know this and that is really the reason why they wear them because nobody who kept a tiger's tail under his clothes for any length of time could help getting fairly snappy if not actually fierce the doctor ordered me to bring him the tail because i happened to be near and he caught my eye this i did and meantime smith got back into his clothes then the doctor told the school it could go about its business all but the culprit and he marched away solemnly and slowly with smith and the tail the tail was very skilfully sewn back into the original place and nobody who did not know the truth could have guessed at what had happened to it and smith told us afterwards that dunstan talked to him till tea-time and then suddenly reminded of the hour by the bell flogged him but very slightly it is always a hopeful sign if the doctor begins a row with talk and the longer he talks the less painful is the end but if he begins with the licking and talks afterwards it is bad and adding insult to injury as steggles says one thing may be worth mentioning 
the doctor never asked for details so smith never gave him any and as old dunston never heard about what freckles did or i did we escaped intact this made what smith had done seem far worse than it was of course we richly rewarded the kid for being such a jolly good plucked one and gave him many a thing worth having and we also made it up pretty thoroughly to fowl for writing the anonymous letter to the doctor it proved to be him because nobody else in the dormitory ever kept awake after everybody else was asleep which was in itself a beastly mean thing to do and we made him finally confess that he had spotted the tail with the help of a chinese torture that tin lin chow had shown us we made him confess it is beautifully simple and a kid can do it and when fowle confessed at the first twinge and said he did it for revenge because young smith had cheeked him in front of about twenty chaps we felt that he was beneath a fine thing like a chinese torture and just kicked the calves of his legs for a little while and then arranged as a punishment for the whole school to send him to coventry for a week which was done End of story four. Story five of the Human Boy Again by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story five Richmond Minimus Preacher one Properly speaking, he wasn't Minimus in his preaching days, but once there were three Richmonds in the field, as Dr. Dunstan used to say, and after Richmond Major went to Sandhurst, young Richmond ought to have become minor, and very much wanted to, but nobody could get into the way of changing it. Even when he was left all alone and Richmond Minor left to go into a tea merchant's office, chaps still called him Minimus his father was a clergyman who had risen into a rural dean but morrison who lived at exeter and understood a frightful deal about religious people said that while a very good thing in its way a rural dean was mere dust beside a cathedral dean he seemed to think really though i don't know whether it is true that a minor canon is almost as classy as a rural dean if not quite anyway the father of richmond minimus was one and until morrison explained that it was nothing to make a fuss about we were all rather interested no doubt it was through his father that richmond got his preaching power he was going into the church himself some day and looked forward to being something out of the common in course of time he said that he always felt a great liking for church even from his earliest years and had never been known to object to going though his brothers especially the one now training to become a tea merchant had not in the least cared for it he was a frightfully good kid and mathers always said he would die young or else get consumption if there was any truth in the stories we were allowed to read on sunday afternoons in these which were different to weekday stories there were many deaths and sometimes the bad boys died and sometimes the good ones but they died in a very different way the good ones died in the lap of luxury with their friends crying around the bed and grapes and clergymen and pretty well everything to make it all right but the bad ones were smashed like flies owing to setting machinery in motion or fell over cliffs birds nesting or got taken up by policemen the difference was that the good ones died from sheer bad health they had hectic coughs or something of that kind and nobody could cure them in fact nobody ever seemed to try to but the bad boys were always as hard as nuts and never had hectic coughs or anything in fact they would all be alive now if they had only gone to church on sundays and not always chosen that day for adventures in these adventures they invariably got mucked up excepting when occasionally they were saved by good boys coming home from church or sometimes even by good girls which stopford said must have been worse than death owing to his hatred of girls this stopford ought to have died a hundred times a sunday really he was not merely bad that was nothing because we all were at any rate none of us were good enough to get consumption but he was a beast as well an utter beast and nobody liked him but fowl and nobody ever liked fowl so in self-defence fowl had to like stopford 
this stopford was a bully among other things and a great hater of richmond minimus i think really it was the frightful sufferings of richmond that made him take to preaching in a way because though richmond minor was as old as stopford he had no muscles being merely a piece of string for strength so though richmond major could tackle stopford and did so till he left after he had gone there was nobody much to care whether stopford bullied the kid or didn't bully him the first time i saw any of the instinct to preaching in richmond minimus was after a footer match it was the time when buckland grammar school licked us rather badly owing to mathers and bray having smoked in secret before the match and being in far too footling a condition to play and richmond said to me afterwards when we went back to dunstan's smothered by four goals to none that often what we did in secret was rewarded openly i said hello that's like the doctor on sunday and he said let us take this defeat in a proper spirit gregson it may be for our good as you know i suffer a great deal from stopford well it will all tell some day i don't exactly understand now why stopford is allowed to twist my arms and then hit the muscles till they ache for hours and often keep me awake at night but there's a reason the reason is that richmond major has gone i said there's a better reason than that he said i may turn stopford from his beastliness yet once or twice i've staggered him a bit with telling him what will come of his cruelty to me that was the first time i seemed to see a screw loose in richmond minimus but he didn't absolutely preach right bang out until we'd had a missionary at the chapel one sunday our chapel was also the big schoolroom and at one end were panels of wood on weekdays which very cunningly opened and turned into the ten commandments on sundays on each side was a door and one was the doctor's private entrance into the chapel and the other was a deep cupboard wherein were kept blackboards large maps and other things in this chapel the missionary who was an old pupil of dr dunstan's preached to us about the heathen of some rather good-sounding place and richmond minimus was so excited that he gave all his pocket money and borrowed two pence of williamson in this manner he subscribed in all five pence and if he could have borrowed more he would have given more from that day he decided to be a missionary at least if not a martyr the missionary was certainly a good preacher besides having seen lions wild it shows the difference between chaps that the lion part interested me most and the heathen part bored me while richmond minimus simply hated the lions but the heathen part seemed to act on him like ginger beer and excite him to a fearful pitch three days afterwards the fit burst out in richmond minimus i came into the big schoolroom one night ten minutes before the tea-bell and there he was preaching to about eight chaps chiefly kids but maine and morant were also there listening maine being high in the sixth words seemed to flow out of richmond as easily as they flow out of a master he was talking about pocket-money what is it but round bits of silver and copper he said yet my dear friends there is a greater power in it and we should not spend it all on self there are thousands of people who never have pocket money but they deserve it quite as much as us perhaps more suppose you have three pence a week which i have myself will it hurt you to yield up one halfpenny to the charity box oh my friends it won't yet that halfpenny given cheerfully every week through the term comes out at twelve halfpennies which is sixpence do it gladly and your holidays will be brighter by sixpence well spent than they otherwise would be here the bell rang and maine seemed in doubt whether to smack young richmond's head or rag him or merely tell him he wasn't to preach again however he did nothing except say to his chum morant that it was queer it wasn't what richmond minimus said but the way he said it he was as keen and solemn as if he'd been preaching to a million people in a cathedral the stuff about his wretched pocket money might have been the most important thing ever uttered by a bishop such was the way he said it you couldn't help listening it was only afterwards when you thought about it that you realized what tommy rot it was 
to cast away a halfpenny into the charity box weekly was a childish idea i thought and gideon who understands the ins and outs of pocket money in a way nobody else does owing to being the son of a diamond merchant said that the idea was false political economy and i said so too as to stop ford the charity box was a painful subject with him ever since the doctor happened to see him putting something into it the doctor had found him subscribing rather often and knowing the other things that stopford did it much surprised him so he set a trap and had the box empty next time stopford subscribed and so at last found out that it was stopford who put in brace buttons a great problem that had puzzled everybody the whole term and they weren't even his own brace buttons after preaching three times richmond minimus had the nerve to attack stopford publicly in a sermon about twenty chaps were listening to him and as soon as he uttered the name stopford prepared to go and scrag him but two or three big fellows told him to sit down and not interfere and richmond was so strung up and in such a frightfully excited state that he sailed right on and spoke about stopford in a way that made many chaps bar stopford for weeks afterwards oh my friends said richmond he was standing up in front of the panels that turn into the commandments on sundays and we were sitting down in the body of the chapel oh my friends and there is another peril a horror that walks in the noonday a human leviathan is seeking what it may devour and its name is stopford i who speak to you know only too well this thorn in the flesh i have suffered many things from him and shall again but i suffer gladly i am chastened for my own good offences must come but woe betide stopford he will have his portion in the burning lake my friends for he is the son of belial and he will call for a cup of cold water and probably none will bring it he is a bully a coward a cribber and a dirty beast who never even washes his neck if he can help it but black though his body be his heart is blacker dear friends it was at this point that stopford jumped up with his eyes blazing but trelawney rapped him on the head and told him to sit down again and richmond minimus went on faster and faster let us christian spirits seek this vile boy and try and lift him out of the slough let us not shun him as a thing unclean let us not dispatch him where the worms they crawl out and the worms they crawl in dear friends but let us rejoice over this sinner as over a piece of silver which is lost by a widow and was found again oh my friends remember that stopford is a human creature with a soul it is hard to believe this but i am right he is one of ourselves that is the sad truth for our own sakes for the sake of the school let us try and turn him from his evil ways and teach him that to twist my arms in the sockets till they ache all night is doing the devil's work and that to kick me till my shins which are very thin bleed and gather is also the devil's work and to take sweets out of desks is also the devil's work not to mention many many other things such as smashing young dobson's birthday present from home and i don't take anybody's sweets you little beast screamed out stopford and the big chaps roared and gave three cheers for richmond and three hisses for stopford it was a frightfully exciting sermon though never finished and richmond minimus seemed quite dazed and wet with perspiration afterwards i talked to him in secret during evening prep and told him i was afraid that stopford would never forgive him and have a fearful score off him sooner or later i said i remember hearing my father tell a story about a great clergyman the champion preacher i believe and being champion he had to preach to queen victoria which he did do but instead of being terrifically careful what he was about he lost his head like you did to-night and i believe he gave it to the queen pretty much like you gave it to stopford not of course that the queen was ever a quarter as bad as stopford in fact it was high treason to say she was bad at all such a magnificent queen as her easily the best ever known in history and everybody was in a frightful rage with the champion preacher and the queen didn't like it too well herself and the result was that he never became the archbishop of canterbury though it was a dead snip for him before 
i know answered richmond minimus but when you're preaching the things come pouring into your mind you can't pick and choose you have to say what you're told to say if you understand me i said i didn't in the least if you wanted to give it to stopford in a sermon you ought to have chosen a time when he wasn't among the audience i said for safety yes admitted richmond but at these times when i preach i care for nothing i caught his little hateful pink-rimmed eyes on me and my rage against him rose i felt like those old prophets when they had to go and give it straight out from the shoulder to the kings that did evil it was jolly fine i said but what about stopford if he would meet me publicly and argue it out said richmond minimus i laughed that's not the way of stopford i said he won't argue about it but he'll give you his sort of sermon when he gets you alone in a corner some evening after dark preachers are often pretty nearly martyred before they've done with it and they die gladly and very likely stopford will martyr you very likely he will said richmond minimus but not as if he looked forward to it Two everybody in the lower school expected some pretty fearful things would happen to richmond but instead a miracle seemed to occur and stopford did nothing gideon thought he might have taken an action for libel against richmond minimus if he had been grown up owing to young richmond saying what he said about stealing sweets it was well known to be true but gideon said that curiously enough in law it didn't matter in the least if you said the truth because the law is often down on the truth far worse than on a lie but stopford never mentioned the matter again and actually behaved kindly to richmond and gave him two new kinds of nibs for his nib collection he also let him have a picture of a very beautiful girl out of a box of cigarettes i asked richmond minimus what he thought of it and he said stopford was converted and that stopford was his first triumph he was so earnest and hopeful about it that i felt when he became a missionary and went into those lands near the equator that he wouldn't be contented with converting niggers but jolly well want to convert lions and everything encouraged by the remarkable success of stopford richmond minimus preached several times more and it got to be a regular lark and chaps came from the other houses to hear him stopford always came and took it frightfully seriously and then happened the row about dr dunstan's medlar tree and mr brown caught stopford after dark and reported him and mr mannering the blue flogged stopford at the order of the doctor now this brown was the least but one of all the masters and without doubt the utterest squirt that ever came to merivale as a master it is true that he was a cambridge man but there was nothing more to be said for him young forrest however knew something more for it happened by a curious accident that he came from the same place that mr brown did what it was that forrest knew we couldn't understand but it appeared that brown gave forrest a great deal of help with his prep on condition that he would not mention it this man was very ignorant and could only teach kids and even them he didn't teach well it was well known that he had many cribs in his room and often especially when he had to take the fourth in algebra he would creep away from time to time and look at his crib swiftly and return and do off a sum on the blackboard as if he had no difficulty at all he was great at having favorites and he always chose sneaks and often turned on them afterwards as he did on fowl and also on stopford over the medlars though when caught stopford solemnly swore to brown that he was getting the medlars for him anyway nobody liked brown and when stopford begged richmond minimus to preach against brown he thought a little and finally said that he would i advised him strongly not to do it i said can't you see the frightful danger some word you may say may get to brown's ears and you may have a flogging at least if you're not expelled but richmond minimus shook his head he said not at all a word in season often does good as in the case of stopford i want to warn the fellows against the mean nature of brown i want to show them what brown is and how a master may use his power like a beast as brown does if it gets back to him you're cooked i said and you know how you work yourself up when you're preaching 
i don't think it's at all wise i've promised answered richmond minimus i'm going to preach to-morrow evening in the time after tea before prep and all brown's house is coming to hear me somehow i felt from the first it would be the undoing of richmond minimus the danger was too frightful however of course i went it was the biggest congregation richmond ever had and he said that he itched to make a collection as he looked at the chaps not for himself but for some good purpose a crowd was in the chapel before i got there and browns were all in a knot together eager and longing to hear what young richmond had to say about brown a lot of fellows from the six had also come in and of course all the personal friends of richmond minimus were there stopford was there also richmond went up to the master's desk at the top of the room full of calm cheek and said a few things of a general sort then he caught stopford's eye this reminded him and he began now i want to speak to you of a subject that will especially interest the boys of mr brown's house namely mr brown my friends i wish i could say something hopeful about him i wish i could tell you that he was a bright shining example for us all to follow and imitate but alas you know it is not so mr brown is a very mean character before saying these words about him i have thought a great deal about him and studied him very closely when i am afraid dear friends i ought to have been studying something else but i tell you fearlessly to beware of him i know he has favourites i know he encourages the sneak and the tale-bearer in our midst i dare say among you at this moment may be some wretched chap who will go to brown after my sermon and tell him what i am saying now but do i care no i do not care nobody need care if they're doing right brown has had a good deal of mystery about him and i have come to the bottom of it one among us who lives where brown does knows the truth i will not name him but he had his head slapped by brown the day before yesterday though it is well known dr dunstan won't allow our heads to be slapped owing to the danger of hurting the brain at any rate brown slapped his and in a moment of natural anger my dear friends that boy told me the truth brown is a tailor's son that of course is nothing against him the shameful and disgusting thing is that brown is ashamed of it he hates to think of it oh my friends what a paltry nature is this i dare say his father is a better man than he is though he does make clothes and i do not hesitate to tell you my friends that brown's father makes clothes a long sight better than brown teaches latin for we have all noticed the scabby manner in which he continually sneaks out of this room during class to rush up to his own study and consult cribs i say nothing of his appearance he cannot help that though he could help those pink ties and those horrid boots with pearl buttons but what i do say is that with such a lesson in our midst we must learn firstly not to be ashamed of our parents whoever they are and secondly not to make friends of dirty sneaks and thirdly not to be a hound in general and fourthly not to pretend we know enough latin and algebra to teach it when really we don't know any worth mentioning and fifthly and lastly my friends what richmond minimus was about to say for fifthly and lastly against the wretched brown we didn't hear for at this point a frightful thing happened the door of the cupboard on richmond's right where the blackboards were kept opened violently and out leapt no less a person than mr brown himself a very strange sound went up from the congregation of richmond minimus but he said nothing for a moment brown stood at bay glaring out of his double eyeglasses like the picture of a wounded tiger in c b fry's magazine then the chaps began to scutter out and many dived and proceeded to the door entirely under the desks hoping they would not be recognized in fact i did this myself but brown was not bothering about us his eyes which squint by nature had turned in upon each side of his nose and he was darting a horrid glance of rage and scorn at richmond minimus then with dreadful slowness he raised his hand and took richmond by the right ear and said come and richmond merely said yes sir and went led by brown to the doctor 
as for me i felt that richmond minimus need never have worried about not being a martyr he was going to be a martyr all right now after the blow had fallen about two days after he told me exactly what happened by a curious chance the doctor was writing a sermon himself when brown appeared before him the doctor always preaches at merivale on the first sunday in the month and this was the sermon he was writing no doubt he put down his pen and took off his glasses and stretched his eyes in a way he has then he told brown to speak and brown said i have to report this boy for insolence and profanity combined never have i known a boy do such a thing before half the school assembled in the great schoolroom he stood up and preached preached said the doctor looking with great surprise at richmond minimus what did he preach about about me said brown furiously he dared to preach about my private affairs at least begin at the beginning said the doctor how did particulars of this outrage reach you brown through the boy stopford said brown and richmond minimus fairly gasped to think how mistaken he had been about converting stopford stopford explained brown came to me and said that he was very much afraid that liberties were to be taken with my name i refused to believe it at first then to satisfy myself i went into the great schoolroom at the time mentioned by stopford and stood behind the blackboards in the cupboard brown then related all that he had heard and richmond minimus said that he trembled with indignation and spoke so fast that dr dunstan had to ask him once or twice to repeat the sentence but richmond admitted that brown's version of the sermon was very fairly just then the doctor said thank you brown i much regret your natural annoyance you may leave the sequel to me so brown hooked it and richmond minimus was left alone with the doctor the doctor said nothing for some time then he sighed and looked at his sermon and rose and went to the cane corner what led you to do this outrageous thing impious boy he asked i felt called to do it sir said richmond minimus i've preached seven times now and more fellows come each time i am aware that you are probably destined for the sacred calling said dunstan solemnly and your theological papers have always led me to regard you as a promising recruit richmond minimus but preaching or i should say a travesty a bizarre burlesque of that difficult branch of the pastor's calling and to select one of your masters for a theme he seemed a good subject to show what we oughtn't to do sir in preaching of course you want the doctor looked his most awful look and richmond minimus dried up probably what i want in preaching is as well known to me as to you preposterous youth said the doctor the present question is not what i want in preaching but what i want in boys and what i expect from boys after they have been for the space of three years under my personal care and control to play the buffoon before your fellows is in any case degrading but to do it under pretence of advancing their moral welfare to preach in jest this is perilously akin to profanity only a vitiated spirit of secularism can explain so gross an action my heart bleeds when i think upon your parents richmond minimus and upon your brothers who worthily upheld the honour and dignity of merivale and now in the wider field of life are bringing forth the good fruit sowed within these scholastic cloisters the doctor always spoke like this about chaps who had left then said richmond minimus the usual event happened and as you know on the next morning i had in addition to tell brown i was sorry publicly after prayers one thing i said what was that fifthly and lastly that you were prevented from preaching but richmond didn't remember and so it was lost shall you ever preach again here i asked him and he said not he said no on the whole it isn't good enough and yet you mustn't think i mind the martyrdom only of course i don't want to be utterly martyred and done for before i grow up he evidently meant to be a martyr in rather a biggish way in foreign parts like the germans in china because when they are bashed by the heathen germany always gets a few miles of china as payment 
and so germany is proud of her martyrs and the emperor too what did become of richmond minimus i can't tell you he ran away once to do good on a large scale but he was captured and brought back before he had time to do much worth mentioning he'll tell you that story himself anyway he never preached again and the whole affair if it did nothing else helped to show what stopford was End of story five. Story six of The Human Boy Again by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story six The Bolsover Prize. One. There was once a chap at Dunstan's, ages and ages ago, called Bolsover, who turned into a novelist afterwards and he was so frightfully keen about other chaps turning into novelists too that he gave a prize for composition it was a book worth a guinea and dr dunstan had to choose it each year and only the junior school was allowed to enter for it according to the conditions made by the chap who gave it gideon calculated it out and said that as twenty pounds is about good for one pound at simple interest in an ordinary way the novelist chap must have handed twenty pounds over to dr dunstan and steggles said he rather doubted if the novelist chap would have much cared for the books that dr dunstan chose for the prizes because they were not novels at all but very improving books chiefly natural history which steggles said was not good for trade from the novelist chap's point of view no doubt old dunstan ought to have bought stories and steggles went further and said that it would have been a sporting thing for dr dunstan to get the novelist chap's own books of which he wrote a great many for a living steggles had read one once in the holidays but he didn't tell me much about it excepting that there was a man who appeared to have about four wives in it and that it had three hundred and seventy-five pages and no pictures anyway the composition prize always interested us in the lower school and it interested me especially once because the subject was wild flowers and my cousin norman tompkins happened to be a frightful dab at them when he heard about it tompkins went instantly to gideon who lends money at usury being a jew and said look here gid i'll sell you the bolsover prize for ten shillings now on the spot as it's worth a pound you'll make fifty per cent profit and gideon said the profit would be about right but where's the prize and tomkins said i've got to write for it on monday week but it's as good as mine because nobody in the lower school knows anything about wild flowers excepting me and i can tell you the name of thirty-four right off the reel so there's an end of it as far as i can see which shows what a hopeful sort of chap tomkins was but unfortunately gideon knew the great hopefulness of tomkins about everything and also knew that it did not always come off he said who are in for the prize and i said first tomkins then walters then smith and also macmullen there you are said tomkins just take them one by one and ask yourself if it was wild animals or queer old customs smith might run me close or even beat me but in the subject of wild flowers he is nothing then young walters doesn't know anything about anything and his english is frightfully wild owing to his having been born in india well that only leaves macmullen and macmullen's strong point is machinery he never looked at a flower in his life when he went out of bounds on the railway embankment he simply sat and watched the signals work and took down the number of a goods engine that was new to him and when he got up i discovered that he'd actually been sitting on a bee orchis one of the rarest flowers in the world when i showed him what he'd done he merely said a bee orchis lucky it didn't sting so that shows he's no use in fact when he hears the subject hasn't got anything to do with steam power i doubt if he'll go in but gideon knew macmullen better he'll go in he said his age is just right and he won't be able to try again he's not the chap to throw away the chance of getting a pound book just because the subject doesn't happen to be steam power besides there's always time allowed to swat up the thing i bet by monday week mac will know as much about wild flowers as you do perhaps more 
of course as a chum of his you say that answered tomkins but i've made a lifetime study of wild flowers and it's childish to think that macmullen or anybody else is going to learn all i know in a week he can spell anyway said gideon which is more than you can in fact gideon didn't seem to so hopeful about tomkins getting the prize as you might have thought and it surprised tomkins a good deal gideon had a right to speak because in his time he'd won this prize himself when he won it the subject happened to be postage stamps which was of course like giving the prize to gideon owing to his tremendous knowledge about money in every shape the time was july and so next half holiday tomkins and me went into the country for a walk for tomkins to freshen up his ideas about the wild flowers he certainly knew a lot but several things that i picked bothered him and once or twice i think he was altogether wrong about them he also picked a good many that he evidently didn't know at all and carried them back to school to ask mr briggs the names of them and anything worth mentioning about them then coming back through merivale who should we see but macmullen with his nose flat against the window of an old bookshop there look here he said there's a second-hand botany in here for seven pence and i've only got five pence i tried the man by showing him the five pence all at once but he wouldn't come down can one of you chaps lend me two pence till next week he looked at the flowers tomkins had picked as he spoke do you know many of them said tomkins knowing well that mac wouldn't only that that nettle said macmullen rather doubtfully it isn't a nettle said tomkins but he was so pleased to see what a frightful duffer macmullen really was that he lent him two pence on the spot i thought he was rather a fool to increase macmullen's chances like this but tomkins said in his large way that a few facts out of a botany book wouldn't help macmullen now especially if he didn't know the difference between sage and nettles by jove i don't believe he knows the difference between sage and onions for that matter said tomkins then mac came out with the book and we all went back together two it was frightfully interesting to see the different ways those four chaps went about trying for the bolsover prize tomkins got special leave off games and spent his spare time in the lanes he confessed to me that he was frightfully ignorant about grasses and thought on the whole that it would be safer to leave them out of the essay macmullen told me that the whole subject bored him a good bit but he thought he could learn enough about it to do something decent in a week because a pound book was worth the fag he was always pulling flowers to pieces and talking about calyxes and corollas and seed cases and stamens and other wild things of that sort i asked tomkins if it promised well for macmullen to learn about stamens and so on and how to spell them and tomkins thought not tomkins said briggs may very likely favour him as we know he has before owing to his feeling for everything scotch from oatmeal downwards but all the same the subject is wildflowers not botany it's rather a poetical subject in a way and that's no good to macmullen no i don't think mac has any chance though he did ask old briggs to lend him the number of the encyclopaedia britannica with botany in it to read in playtime i believe briggs was pleased though i said for i heard him answer that mac was going the right way to work anyway mac read quite half the article and copied some out on a bit of paper before he chucked it in despair tomkins nodded and i think he saw that it was rather a grave thing for macmullen to have done i might read it myself he said i'm a little foggy between genera and species and varieties and natural orders and so on not that all that stuff matters what you want is really the name of the wild flowers themselves and their colours and ways do you happen to know any poetry about flowers of a sort easily learned by heart i didn't but young smith who was there answered that he did he said what you say about poetry is awfully interesting to me tomkins because i had thought the same and i know many rhymes of a queer sort and i can make rhymes rather well myself and i had an idea i would try and do the whole of my composition in rhyme like your cheek said tomkins my dear kid it will take you all your time to write prose and what do you know about flowers anyway well, i do know something said smith owing to my father who collects odd rhymes and things it's called folklore 
it includes queer names of plants and animals also about remedies for warts and the charms for curing animals from witches and overlooking and such like i know some awful funny things anyway that my governor has told me though they may not be true tomkins was a good deal interested in this fancy a kid like you knowing anything at all about it he said there was only walters left but he was no good at all and he'd simply gone in for it because his people insisted upon his doing so i asked walters if he knew much about wild flowers and he answered something about cucumber sandwiches which he had once eaten in large quantities owing to being forgotten at a lawn tennis party he seemed to think because a cucumber was a vegetable and a flower was a vegetable that a cucumber was a flower he said that was all he knew about the subject excepting that dogs ate grass when not feeling well so i told tomkins he needn't bother about walters tomkins however assured us that he wasn't bothering about any of them he said that facts were the things and not theories so while macmullen swatted away at his botany and smith collected rhymes and offered anybody three links of a brass chain for a word that rhymed with toad flax and walters merely waited for the day and made no effort as far as we could see tomkins poked about and went one evening out of bounds with freckles and young corky into the famous quarry at merivale great wood they were chased but escaped owing to the strategy of freckles and tomkins felt the bolsover prize was now an absolute cert for him because in the preserves he had met with an exceedingly rare flower at least he said so and he believed that by mentioning it and making a sketch of it in his paper he would easily distance macmullen who did not so much as know there was such a flower as far as ages went i must tell you that tomkins was thirteen and two weeks and macmullen thirteen and seven months while smith was ten and walters merely nine and a half all four put on a little side about it the sunday before and a good many other fellows wished they had gone in because the papers had to be written in the doctor's own study and there are some magnificent pictures and marble statues in that room such as are very seldom seen by the lower school i asked each one after breakfast on the appointed day how he felt and tomkins said hopeful and macmullen said much as usual and smith said sleepy because i've been awake nearly all night remembering rhymes i've heard my father say and walters said he had a sort of rather horrid wish that his father had died the term before because he didn't think his mother would ever have made him go in for a thing he hated so much as this three two hours were allowed for the essay and by good luck i happened to meet the four chaps just as they came out so i got their ideas fresh on what they'd done curiously enough all four were hopeful tomkins of course i knew would be and probably also macmullen but smith and even walters seemed to fancy they had a chance too this astonished me a good deal so i said to smith how the dickens do you think any stuff you can have done would be near to what my cousin tomkins has done and he said because of the rhymes i was quite astonished myself to find how they came and i also remembered a charm for nettle rash and some awfully peculiar sayings just at the right moment and walters also declared he'd done better than he expected to do he seemed rather flustered about it and wouldn't give any details but he was highly excited and inked up to the eyes as you might say he gave me the idea of a chap who'd been cribbing macmullen looked rather a pale yellow colour which he always does look at moments of great excitement especially just before his innings at cricket he wouldn't say a word to a soul until he'd gone to his botany book and read up a lot of stuff and then he felt better as to tomkins he told me privately as his cousin that he had got in the names of no less than forty-five plants and seven grasses that must settle it he said and i said i thought so too mr briggs corrected the essays that night and prepared some notes upon them for the doctor to read when the time of announcing the winner came we all stared jolly hard at briggs during prep the next day and steggles who has no fear of old briggs asked him who had won but briggs merely told him to mind his own business after prayers the next day the doctor stopped in the chapel which was also a schoolroom and told everybody to remain in his place 
then he whispered to corky major and corky went off and presently came back with a very swagger book bound in red leather and having a yellow back with gold letters upon it the doctor dearly likes these occasions and so do we because it means missing at least one class for certain when he once fairly begins talking he keeps at it now he had the four essays on the desk in front of him and the prize and then he spoke to briggs and briggs led up macmullen and tomkins and smith and walters they knew this was coming and had all prepared to a certain extent i noticed that smith had borrowed a green tie from webster and that mac had turned his usual hue at times of excitement walters was still inky despite pumice stone we have now my boys to make our annual award of the harold bolsover prize for english composition began the doctor mr bolsover whose name is now not unfavourably known to his countrymen as an ingenious fabricator of romance was educated at this seminary to me it fell to instruct his incipient intellect and lift the vacuity of his childish mind upwards and onwards into the light of knowledge and religion the art of fiction while it must not be considered a very lofty or important pursuit may yet be regarded as a permissible career if the motives that guide the pen are elevated and a high morality is the author's first consideration lack of leisure does not permit me to read story-books myself but i have little doubt that mr bolsover's work is all that it should be from the christian standpoint and i feel confident that those lessons of charity patience loyalty and honour which he learnt from my own lips have borne worthy fruit in his industrious brain the work i have selected for the bolsover prize is gilpin on forest scenery a book which leads us from nature to the contemplation of the power above and behind nature a book wherein the reverend author has excelled himself and presented to our minds the loftiest thoughts and to our eyes the most noble scenes that his observance could record and his skill compass within the space of a volume for this notable reward four lads have entered in competition and their emulation was excited by the theme of wild flowers which your senior master mr briggs very happily selected wild flowers are the jewellery of our hedgerows scattered lavishly by nature's own generous hand to gladden the dusty wayside to bring a smile to the face of the wanderer in the highway and brightness to the eyes of the weary traveller by flood and field none of you can have overlooked them on your road to your sport even in the very grass whereon you pursue your pastimes the wild flowers abound they decked the level sward they smile at us from the cricket field they help to gladden the hour of mimic victory or soften the bitter moment of failure as we return defeated to the silent throng at the pavilion rails now i have before me the thoughts of nicole mcmullen norman tomkins huxley smith and rupert walters on this subject and i very much regret to say that not one of them has produced anything which may be considered worthy of merivale worthy of mr bolsover or worthy of themselves i do not overlook their tender years i am not forgetting that to a mind like my own or that of mr briggs richly stored with all the best and most beautiful utterances on this subject the crudities of immaturity must come with the profound and pitiful significance of contrast no no i judge these four achievements from no impossible standard of perfection i know too well how little can be expected from the boy who is but entering upon his teens i am too familiar with the meagre attainments of the average lad of one decade to ask for impossible accuracy for poetic thought or pious sentiments but certain qualities i have the right to expect nay demand here steggles whispered to me blessed if i don't think he's going to cane them certain qualities mr harold bolsover has also the right to expect and demand do we find them in these essays before us reluctantly i reply we do not but in order that you may judge whether your headmaster is unreasonable that you of the upper school may estimate the nature of the efforts upon which i base this adverse criticism i propose to read brief extracts from each and from all of them 
the initial error of the boy nicole mcmullen appears to be a total misconception of the theme he was invited to illuminate he begins his essay as follows the doctor made a frightful rustling among mac's papers and everybody looked at mac he had not expected this and his mouth worked very rummily and his head went down between his shoulders and he showed his under teeth and stared in a frightfully fixed way at the boot of smith who sat next to him then dr dunstan began wild flowers by nicole mcmullen the vegetable kingdom is a very large one john ray a native of sussex did much to advance the study of it he was born in sixteen twenty eight and died in seventeen o five there was a history of plants written three hundred years before christ linnaeus was the man who invented the sexual system a very useful invention it is a stepping stone he first mentioned it in seventeen thirty six seaweeds are also a part of the vegetable kingdom but they have no flowers and so may be dismissed without further mention also algae of leaves it may be said that some fall and some do not at least speaking strictly all fall and this is called a deciduous tree but not all at once and this is called an evergreen glands occur in the tissues of the leaves and they also have hairs buds also have hairs the organs of plants is almost the largest subject in the vegetable kingdom but i have no time to mention more than one or two organs to-day the root descends into the soil the stems rise aloft and the flowers bud out at the ends of them mistletoe and broom rape are called parasites because they live on other trees instead of being on their own coming now to flowers we find that they may be divided into two main families wild and garden we shall dismiss garden flowers as they do not belong to our subject but wild flowers are the most beautiful things in the vegetable kingdom especially honeysuckle and blackberries many others will occur to the reader also the flower is the tout ensemble of those organs which are concerned in reproduction the doctor stopped and put down macmullen's essay for my part i was simply amazed at the amount mac knew and i think everybody else was but strangely enough the doctor didn't like it from this point our author quotes verbatim out of the pages of the encyclopedia britannica continued dr dunstan as an effort of memory the result is highly creditable and macmullen will have acquired a great deal of botanical knowledge which may possibly be of service to him in his future career but as an essayist on wild flowers he is exceedingly evasive and his effort fails radically and fundamentally the subject is obviously not one that appeals to him there is no sympathy no love of his theme above all no moral deductions macmullen's mind has not been uplifted he has in fact failed macmullen didn't seem to care as much as you would have thought he told me afterwards he felt so thankful when the doctor shut up about him and turned to tomkins that he forgot everything else but relief tomkins became red when the doctor picked up his essay but it soon faded away i mean the redness now here said dr dunstan we are met by an attempt of a very different character the boy tomkins appears to think that there is nothing more to be said about the flowers of the field than to utter their names his prose lacks dignity there is a feverish desire to tell us what everything is called there is no poetry no feeling vagueness indeed we have but vagueness is not poetry though to uncritical minds it may sometimes pass for such this is how tomkins approaches his subject there is a breathlessness a feeling of haste as if somebody was chasing tomkins along the road while he was making his researches this unless tomkins has been guilty of trespass an alternative i refuse to consider is difficult to explain the doctor then gave us a bit out of tomkins as one walks down a country lane one can often hardly see the leaves for the flowers they burst upon the view in millions the hedges are thronged with them the scent is overpowering turn where you will they greet the bewildered eye they hang from the trees and spring from the earth they twine also as for instance briony and convolvuluses at a single glance i take in dog roses campions of several sorts including white shepherd's purse a weed strawberry primroses cuckoo flowers violet bugle herb robert 
and also other wild geraniums of various kinds they are in a crowded mass all struggling for life stitchwort nettle archangel coxfoot grass clematis dock heath firs bog moss darned dandelions daisies buttercups of sorts marshmallow water lilies rushes and reeds poppies and peppermint also ferns one sees them all at a glance then as one hastens swiftly onwards i gasp for breath said the doctor i absolutely refuse to hasten swiftly onwards with tomkins at this breakneck pace he drags us through that portion of the british flora at his command there is doubtless knowledge here there is even reflection as when he says at the end of his paper that wild flowers ought to make us thankful for our eyesight and for the lesser gift of smell but taken as a whole we have no balance absolutely no repose no light and no shade there is too much hurry and bustle too little feeling for the beauty attaching to english scenery or english prose too eager a desire to display erudition in the empty matter of floral nomenclature so that was the end of tomkins he was frightfully disappointed but he felt so interested to know what wretched chaps like smith and walters had done that was better that he forgot even to be miserable about losing until afterwards then the doctor went for smith huxley smith next challenges our attention he said now here we are confronted with a still more amazing misunderstanding smith appears to know absolutely nothing whatever concerning wild flowers but he has seized this occasion to display an extraordinary amount of peculiar information concerning other matters he evidently imagines that this will answer his purpose equally well moreover he endeavours to cast his work in a poetic form with results that have bewildered even me despite my half-century of knowledge of the genus puer i do not say that rhyme is inadmissible you shall not find me slow to encourage originality of thought even among the least of you but smith trusts too little to himself and too much to other rhymesters i will not call them poets he has committed to memory many verses of a trivial and even offensive character he has furnished me with a charm or incantation to remove warts elsewhere he commits himself to sentiments that may be described as flagrantly irreligious it is true he glances obliquely at his subject from time to time but not in a spirit which can admire or commend we have for instance these lines put yarrow under your pillow they say you will see your true love the very next day for pain in the stomach an excellent thing is tea made of mint and sprigs of ling if you wash your clothes on good friday some one will be certain to die ere the year is done whence huckley smith has called these pitiful superstitions i know not continued the doctor but he appears to be a veritable storehouse and compendium of them they remind me only too painfully of a certain tiger's tale though that incident is closed and i desire to make no further mention of it had our theme been folklore or those crude benighted and indelicate fancies still prevailing among the bucolic population smith must have conquered and easily conquered but it is not so however he has chosen the occasion of the bolsover competition to reveal no little fantastic knowledge but its lack of appropriate and apposite qualities effectually disposes of his claim i will give you a last sample of his methods a propos of absolutely nothing on page four of his dissertation smith submits this impertinence he appears suddenly to have recollected it and inserted it in the body of his work without the least consideration for its significance or my feelings there was an old man who lived in a wood as you may plainly see and said he could do more work in a day than his wife could do in three the doctor looked awful sternly at smith this fragment from some coarse old ballad i suspect is thrust upon me as one might brandish a club in the face of an unoffending citizen smith must chasten his taste and study the rudiments of logic and propriety before again he ventures to challenge our attention with original thoughts silence silence 
thundered the doctor in conclusion because smith's stuff made steggles laugh out loud then several other chaps laughed and in trying not to laugh wolf minor choked and made a noise like a football exploding that was far worse than laughter there remains the effort of rupert walters went on dr dunstan he is the youngest of the competitors and i find but little to praise in his achievement yet it indicates a shadow of promise and a shade of imagination indeed mr briggs at first suspected that walters had availed himself of secret and dishonest assistance but this i rejoice to know is not the case walters has yet to learn to control the discharge of ink from his pen and in matters of orthography also there is much to be desired for him a remark which applies to all the competitors save macmullen but he possesses a dim and misty nucleus of feeling for the dignity of his native tongue there is in his attempt a suggestion that at some distant date if he is spared and if he labours assiduously in the dead languages rupert walters may control his living speech with some approach to distinction i select his most pleasing passage the doctor regarded young walters over his spectacles for a moment with a frightfully encouraging expression that he sometimes puts on when things are going extra well then he read the pleasing passage as he called it often walking in the country far from home you may see the briars falling over the sides of the lanes and the may trees white with bloom they look lovely against the blue sky and a curious thing is that the distant trees also look blue and not green by reason of distance near at hand yellow and red flowers may be dotted about but when you look along the lane you only see haze which is beautiful if there is a river flowing near by it is also very beautiful indeed especially with water lilies in it and clouds are lovely too if reflected in a sheet of water beside which yellow irises spring up and their foliage looks rather bluish if a trout rises it makes white rings on the water now here said the doctor is a humble effort to set down what the eye of this tender boy has mirrored in the past i need not tell you how he spells irises or curious or beautiful the fact remains that he has distanced his competitors and achieved the bolshever prize come hither rupert walters let me shake your hand my lad so that was the end of it and walters seemed more frightened than anything but he took his book and the matter ended and the four chaps had their essays back with briggs red pencil remarks on them to send home to their people the extraordinary truth only came to me three days later when i happened to be having a talk with walters and looking at his prize which was duller even than most prizes i said how the dickens did you remember that trees look blue seen a mile off and he said i didn't remember it if you'll swear not to tell i'll explain i shall be rather glad to tell somebody so i swore and then walters said i was just sitting biting my pen and drawing on the blotting paper and casting my eyes about and wondering what on earth to say when i saw right bang in front of me a great picture a whacker full of trees and a lane and water and hills and every mortal thing even to the flowers dabbed about in front well there you are i just tried to put down what i saw and i did it only too well if anything of course in a sort of way it was cribbing but then of course in another sort of way it wasn't anyway you've sworn not to tell not even tomkins so of course you won't tell and of course i did not End of chapter six